Good afternoon and good evening. Hi, good evening. This is Kelly Pfeiffer from Manor College. Thanks so much for being with us today. Not at all. The only thing is timing. I thought the invite I have says that the program starts at six o'clock. Hmm. I believe the panelists were asked to join at six, but um, the event, I believe, starting at 630. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'm in the middle of a legislative negotiation, so I'm going to go on. If I'm, can you hear me? Sure. Everything's yep. Great. You you look and sound great. Okay, I'm going to then go back to my office and work for another 15, 20 minutes. Okay. Sure, of course. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Hello, Minister Yarasko. I'm John Perry, the president here at Manor College. Welcome. Hey, John, it's Kelly. Minister, right she had to um, hop off on, onto something else, but her audio video looked great. So we kind of did a Fantastic. test, but she has to, she'll come back on closer to 6.30. Okay, that's great. How are you doing? Good. We um, we have six folks right now in um, the attendees. Thank you. Hi to the six of you who are there. And great. on webinar, um, once you start, everyone can, can see what's going on. So we appreciate you guys okay. hanging out with us. The program starts at 6.30. Um, feel free to leave and come back. We'll be starting shortly then. Thank you, Kelly. Congressman, welcome. Hello, doctor, how are you? I'm good, thank you. We are joined currently by our host, Manor Events, which is our marketing office, as well as Minister Natalie Garesco. We're not ready to start just yet. We do already uh, have something of an audience, so you're free to um, stop your video and mute your mic for a couple of minutes until we get started at 6.30. Oh, well, that's good. Um, let me ask you, uh, I, I must admit, I'm doing this from the laptop uh, or the desktop, rather, in um, our bedroom. I hope the lighting looks all right. Um, um, do, do, th do things look okay? You look perfect. Okay. <laughs> I didn't mean me so much, but just <laughs> the, you know, the, yeah, the lighting. Our, everything looks fine. We can see you and hear you clearly. So uh, thankfully and hopefully we'll have no issues. Uh, great. Well, I'm looking forward to tonight. Thank you for including me. Of course, and we're grateful that you're here. Thank you. You bet. All right. I'll see you in a moment. Okay, great. Should be the bottom left of your screen to mute your video and your audio. Got it.
Hello, Michael. How are you? Fine, Jonathan. How are you? Good, thanks. Thanks for joining us early. Yes, we are, absolutely. We're going to get started in just about 10 minutes, and we already do have uh, an audience present with us. It looks like we've got uh, 14 people in growing. So um, Minister Yoresko has joined us as well, and so has Congressman Hoffel. So uh, like I said, we'll be starting in just a few minutes here. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, and your video and audio looks good. So far, so good, as they say, right? <laughs> exactly. I just need to... I forgot my jacket, actually, so let me... <laughs> That's fine. Well, you're welcome to do that. We're going to... Let me uh, just put on my jacket. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome to also mute yourself and your video and then... And then join us back in a minute. Good afternoon, Ambassador. We're glad to have you joining us. Good afternoon. This is Ruslan Falkov, Assistant as Ambassador. I'm checking the connection right now. Glad Very good. Thank you, Ruslan. Ambassador will join us directly at 630. Thank you. Yes, we should be starting right on time. Thank you. Thank you.
Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. We're going to get started. Thank you for joining us today with America's only accredited institution of higher education, founded by the Ukrainian Sisters of St. Basil the Great, and remaining true to our Ukrainian heritage, Manor College. Unique as a college in the United States, we proudly say, Slava Ukraina. Thank you. We thank our Board of Trustees Chairman, Dennis McGrath, and Manor's Ukrainian Community Committee of its Board of Trustees, chaired by Leonard Mazur, for supporting our mission, heritage, and our programs, especially today's. Manor College offers more than 50 associates, bachelor's, and certificate programs in business, education, and professional studies. We also offer programs in arts and sciences and allied health. We provide our students with excellent academic and transformative opportunities that enable them to fully develop as individuals. An education at Manor leads to an understanding of scientific, humanistic, and ethical principles. So our students form a global vision. Leading by example in this department is Manor Board of Trustee member Eugene Luchu. I just found out today that Jean is being honored by the Ukrainian Federation of America at their 30 years of service celebration, which is coming up on Saturday, November 6th at 4 p.m. We congratulate Jean. And if anyone's interested in attending the UFA event, please call 215-782. 1075 to reserve a seat. Today's program is a dialogue. We will have some time for questions and answers at the end, as determined solely by our moderator. Today is Manor College's 11th Ukraine Dialogue Series program, and it's formally titled Ukraine Dialogue 30 Years of Ukrainian Independence, Part Two Linguistic, Financial and religious implications. Manor College is a Ukrainian Catholic institution and we start all of our Ukraine dialogue programs with a prayer. Please join me. Holy Spirit of wisdom, you refresh us with your life-saving power. You have entrusted us with a share in leadership. Help us to diplomatically exchange ideas and concepts with one another, keep us kind and courteous, give us insights about the work at hand that we may further your causes, benefit the people of Ukraine and America and protect and keep safe all of your children. Help us to resist temptation and remind us of each other's needs. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Today's program has a leadership sponsor, the Ukrainian Self-Reliance Federal Credit Union, who we're so proud and honored to partner with. The UKRFCU and its leadership have helped us to sustain our program and make each greater. Roman Pettick is chairman of UKRFCU's board, Mary Kolody, its president, Anatoly Murha, is the credit union's senior vice president, and Helena Keller, the vice president of finance. All have been instrumental to tonight's program. As such, let's take a minute to recognize Chairman Pettick. And is Roman with us? Can I ask him to say a few words? Yes, good evening, Jonathan. I am indeed here. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Roman. Okay, great. <laughs> Uh, on behalf of Ukrainian Self-Reliance Federal Credit Union and its 12,000 member account holders, it is my pleasure to welcome everyone to the fall 2021 session of the Ukraine Dialogues. This is the sixth year that UKRFCU is serving as the sponsor of this important community forum. As we did for the session held last March, we are once again meeting via video feed. While we all miss seeing one another face-to-face, -face, the video format does offer an opportunity to engage with an audience from areas that would not normally draw physical participants. 
and indeed more than 100 audience members are logged into today's session. We hope that this will be the last session does not, that does not also include an opportunity to meet and interact with our presenters in person. You can help ensure that future Ukraine dialogues take place in person by getting vaccinated against COVID-19 and by encouraging friends and family members to do likewise. While UKRFCU's financial support helps make the dialogue series possible, in reality, we are much more than a financial sponsor. Ukrainian Self-Reliance Federal Credit Union approaches this event with the same passion that we bring to all of our work on behalf of the community. We and Manor College are committed to bringing you speakers who offer our audiences the most sophisticated and in-depth information about current conditions in Ukraine and the challenges that this fledgling democracy faces. I expect you will agree that today's panel, which includes two former finance ministers of Ukraine, one of whom is Ukraine's current ambassador to the United States, as well as former Congressman Joseph Hoffel, who for six years represented a suburban Philadelphia district that included Manor College and a large Ukrainian American constituency. We hope that you will agree that these panelists certainly measure up to that standard. These events require a significant amount of advanced planning and preparation. And I would be remiss if I failed to acknowledge the work of Anatoly Murha, our credit union's vice president, senior vice president responsible for community outreach and of Kelly Pfeiffer, Manor's vice president for marketing. Anatoly and Kelly have worked hand in glove to ensure the success of this event and the dialogues program as a whole. UKRFCU is privileged to join with Manor College in making these programs possible. And we are delighted that you are able to join us this evening. Dr. Perry. Thank you very much, Roman. We appreciate your words. Now let's introduce our speakers. We're blessed with an amazing panel of speakers, all of whom are here today out of their pure, gracious kindness. Their credentials speak for themselves. With our limited time, my introductions will be brief and each of our speakers <clears throat> are encouraged to share more about themselves because they are all remarkably talented. Ambassador Oksana Markarova will be our first speaker. I was first introduced to Ambassador Markarova by Irina Mazor. And of course, I'm grateful to Irina, who herself serves as Pennsylvania's Honorary Consul of Ukraine. Early in her career, Ambassador Markarova was appointed as first Deputy Minister of Finance of Ukraine. She became the government's entitled representative for investments in Ukraine. In this position, she launched Ukraine Invest, the office for the attraction and promotion of investors, as well as facilitating a number of initiatives to support existing investors and to gain new investments for Ukraine. She also created eData, the biggest web portal of open data on public finances. In 2018, Ambassador Markarova was appointed as the Minister of Finance of Ukraine. Then earlier this year in 2021, she was appointed to the Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary of Ukraine and of, I'm sorry, of Ukraine to the United States. Ambassador Markarova is a member of the Advisory Council of the National University of Kiev Mohila Academy, a member of the Assembly of Friends of the Ukrainian Catholic University, and she is a member of the International Organization of Young Presidents. Next is Minister Natalie Yaresko. Natalie was designated Executive Director of the Financial Oversight and Management Board for Puerto Rico in March of 2017. She has a distinguished international career in public service and the private industry with over 25 years of successful management experience in strategy and negotiation development and implementation of public policy and business objectives, especially during crisis periods. As Minister of Finance of Ukraine from 2014 to 16, she served as one of the at one of the most critical times in Ukraine's history when the country was affected by deep recession 
foreign occupation and war. During her tenure, she led the successful negotiation and implementation of the largest IMF program in the institution's history, as well as a complex sovereign and sovereign guarantee debt restructuring. And Congressman Joe Hoffel is an American author and politician. Congressman Hoffel was a member of the United States House of Representatives from 1999 to 2005, representing Pennsylvania's 13th Congressional District. He also served multiple terms on the Mont Montgomery County Board of Commissioners. And from 1977 to 84, he was a member of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives. A native of Philadelphia, he's a graduate of Boston University and Temple Law School. During his time in government, he sponsored legislation regarding and made efforts to support Ukraine. Our moderator this evening is Michael Salkew Jr. He is the director of the Ukrainian Congress Committee of America's Washington DC Bureau, the Ukrainian National Information Services. Founded in 1940, the UKK was enabled the Ukrainian American community to generate the political capital and momentum needed to aid the people of a sub subjugated Ukraine during Soviet times and since 1991, a free, and independent country. During World War II, the UKK included relief efforts for Ukrainian war victims and refugees and advocating for the passage of the Displaced Persons Act of 1948. UKK has been active in Ukraine reform processes through its international election observer missions for all of Ukraine's elections since 1994. Its Washington office is responsible for advocating concerns of the Ukrainian community in Congress. Michael also serves as chairman of the U.S. Committee for Ukrainian Holodomor Genocide Awareness, an entity whose projections promote knowledge of the Holodomor and recognition of the Holodomor as a genocide. We are grateful for Michael's service this evening as our program moderator. Michael, I will turn it over to you. Good evening, um, Dr. Perry, thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction. Um, as you had alluded uh, earlier in your introdu in introduction that you can add something, I'd like to add that uh, I shall now be called a professional moderator since this is my third event today that I am moderating. <laughs> so it's an honor to be here um, and to moderate this Manor College Dialogue Series entitled 30 Years of Ukrainian History part two, linguistic, financial, and religious implications, in which we will explore Ukraine's societal and business achievements in the linguistic, financial, and religious realms. As mentioned by Dr. Perry, we have assembled a marvelous panel of experts, all current or former government officials, who will provide their perspective and analysis of Ukraine's ever-changing and reform-minded society and the accomplishments in advancing democratic principles in Ukraine. Given the context of current dramatic events and activities in Ukraine in the region, such as the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2014 and the most recent buildup of Russian troops on Ukraine's border, the NATO summit and President Biden's meeting with Vladimir Putin in June of 2021, the 2019 Tomos of Ukrainian Orthodoxy, the law for use of Ukrainian language on Ukrainian television channels, and the strategic objective of Ukraine's constant fight against corruption, we will hear from our panelists and seek their counsel, analysis, and policy recommendations for advancing Ukraine's progressive society that is in, that is in sync and with the norms of Western principles and institutions. We'll now hear remarks from our experts. To our audience members, please note, that all questions for the experts are, the, are to be submitted in the question and answer function, the Q&A function below on your screen. Thank you. And now to the panelists. And it is my understanding that each panelist will be afforded uh, 15 to 20 minutes for your remarks, at which time, uh, after which time we will uh, provide questions and answers. We will commence with Her Excellency, Ambassador Oksana Markarova. Madam Ambassador, please. Slava Isusu Christu. It's such a pleasure to be here today and to end the day 
in this wonderful discussion with uh, a dear friend and a remarkable, remarkable uh, former minister of finance and business leader. And uh, there is a long list of titles you can uh, talk about uh, Natalie Yeresko. And I think it would be great to talk in this, uh, uh, in, uh, in this venue and specifically in this uh, college about Ukraine dialogue, about the issues which are important for Ukraine right, right now, about issues, issues which are priorities for our US-Ukraine relations. And where do we go from this year where we celebrate the 30th uh, anniversary of Ukraine's recent independence? Uh, I just came today from an event that we have organized with a wife, uh, with Katerina Yevsipenko, who's the wife of Vladislav Yevsipenko, a journalist, Ukrainian uh, journalist of Radio Freedom, who for eight months is uh, illegally arrested and detained and tortured in, by Russians in Crimea. And it kind of puts the perspective that we cannot start talking about linguistic, financial, religious, or any other implications until we start with the implication number one with the security dimension of uh, everything that happens in Ukraine right now. For while we're celebrating the 30th anniversary of our independence, so we talk about our country as a young country. You know, 30 years is not a lot. It seems to be not a lot. But we also know that it's only 30 years this time. But our nation has thousands of years of history behind us. And yet, during the previous centuries, for exactly the same reason as we have right now, uh, while enduring this Russian aggression, we were not able to either get to our statehood and or retain it for a long time. And every time the attack that was uh, uh, waged on Ukraine by practically the same neighbor, whatever you call it, whether it's Russian Empire or the Soviet Union, is for exactly the same reason, for making a civilizational choice to be Ukrainian, to be European, to be free, to be democratic, to be part of the free world, which we as Ukrainians and religion is our freedom, believe we belong to. So for, the, for, the, for eight years right now, Ukraine is at the forefront of this fight for democracy, fight for our territorial integrity. And this defines uh, quite a number of issues in inside Ukraine. And you would think that country that is fighting for its own existence for eight years would not be a democratic country. But yet Ukraine is a miracle in that sense. And we do believe in democracy. We do believe in freedom, all kinds of freedom, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, uh, freedom of uh, all, all, all other individual Freedom. So while we are fighting for our territorial integrity and for uh, our independence, we also fight internally to keep and to develop the freedom and also transform the economy. So I would refer to the last visit of President Zelensky to Washington DC and the meeting of uh, both of our presidents. Again, the United States is the strategic uh, uh, friend, as we should say, a strategic ally and strategic partner, but also strategic friend. Uh, and we, in the joint statement of both presidents, exactly uh, described all the areas, which again coincide with the topic of our dialogue today, essentially saying that there is priority number one, which is security and defense. And that's where not only we have signed quite a number of agreements and the uh, uh, framework uh, agreement on the foundation of our defense cooperation, but also clearly stated that we as the country want to become uh, whole, we want to get the Crimea back, we want to get the Donetsk and Lugansk uh, oblast back, and we want to free all our citizens and return to the normal life. We also would like and we see ourselves as in the future as part of NATO, and we would like to build the capabilities so that Ukraine can be not only a safe country, but also a very important player in ensuring that there is a peace and security in the Black Sea region and in the region as a whole. The second large uh, uh, priority is, of course, the democracy, fight for democracy and humanitarian rights. And Ukraine is very active there. As you know, right now, uh, all the teams of the Radio Free Europe from Belarus, from Russia, are located and broadcasting from Ukraine. Uh, and we also were the first ones to evacuate the Radio Free Europe team from Afghanistan to Ukraine. So Ukraine is becoming this uh, hub for the freedom-loving people, for people who believe in, uh, 
in the, in the freedom of speech and democracy. And we would like to be also a place where that flourishes in, 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 in Europe. And the, the, the large priority number three is economic transformation. It's essential that Ukrainian people and compliant businesses participate in this wealth. I mean, for years, and here we work together with Natalie in private equity, we work together with Natalie in the Ministry of Finance, and for the past 30 years, everyone who ever attended any conference on Ukraine heard the phrase that Ukraine is, has a huge potential in attracting investments and huge potential to become one of the economic tigers in Eastern Europe or in Europe in general. We have the great location, we have natural resources, we have highly educated workers. I mean, I can recite this from the top of my head and I've heard it so many times starting from 1995. Yet, we are still to realize that potential. And that's why we have started this very difficult transformation in 2014. That's why we not only stabilized the economy and returned to economic growth, but we also started essentially reforms and transformation in every sector of, of Ukrainian life. From the decentralization to the budgetary reform, to financial sector reform, monetary policy reform, land reform, you name it we had to essentially rebuild everything from scratch because again, going back to the history, for the past 400 years, Ukraine never had its own institutions. And even when we finally gained our independence in 1991, we were handed, we were handed down the post-Soviet institutions and which were never truly reformed starting from 1991. So we are doing this exercise essentially for the first time in the recent eight years while being attacked, while being at war, and while dealing with a lot of difficult challenges inside the country. Now, is everything is super positive? Of course not. Of course, there is a lot of homework to be done. Uh, and together with the US as our main partner, but also international partners who share our values, who share our freedom and support our fight for freedom, I'm sure that we will be able to achieve what we would like to achieve. But I would like to again come back to the opening by Dr. Perry that it's very important while we are doing all of that, remember about you know, the, the universal human values, the, the principles and, and uh, values that we all share that while we are achieving all of that, while we are fighting for the good cause, that we also have to stay true to ourselves, true to our beliefs. And we also have to think about whether everything that we are doing makes people successful, makes Ukrainians happy, makes Ukrainians participate in, the, in, in, in what we are doing as the government, civil society, business, so that we are building a better country for our citizens. So with that, you know, since it's a dialogue, I would not want to uh, take a lot of the time, but just to say that, uh, you know, the team that I have here in Washington DC works tirelessly with both Team Ukraine back home, but also a huge Team Ukraine that we have here in the United States. I am blessed as an ambassador that pretty much in every large city in the US, we do have Ukrainians by birth, by blood, or by choice. A, a large army of our Ukrainian diaspora, uh, which helps us uh, to do everything that we would like to do faster, more efficient. Uh, and I would like to finish with, uh, saying to everyone and to your students, please do more. Uh, we all can benefit from Ukraine being more successful. Both Ukraine and the US will benefit from increase of the relations between of our countries. Uh, and I'm sure we will have a very interesting discussions today. Thank you. Minister Yaresko, please. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. And it's truly an honor, together with my friend and ambassador, uh, as well as the congressman, uh, to be here tonight. You know, if I were to look back on the past 30 years with an eye towards the future of Ukraine, I would say it is one single thing that has made Ukraine what it is today. And that is its very engaged civil society. I would argue that it is civil society that has held Elected, uh, uh, elected officials accountable. I would argue that if you look to our political system, we've lived through three revolutions since 1991. And that was civil society demanding first independence, then transparency and fairness in elections, later dignity, European values, reform, 
that came about not as a result, unfortunately, of successful necessarily political systems leadership, but instead because of the demands of a successful engaged civil society. Similarly with religious freedom, as the ambassador noted, Ukraine takes the first place in all of the former Soviet Union with regard to religious freedom. And that is civil society that has made the Ukrainian Catholic Church, which was underground until 1991, free and flourishing. It is Ukrainian society that demanded and insisted on recognition of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Ukraine. We received our Tomos in 2018, and now we have over 7,000 parishes in a free Ukrainian Orthodox Church. It is that civil society that ensures that every faith has the freedom to worship. And we have an interfaith council. We have strong and vibrant Jewish communities, strong and vibrant Muslim communities. We have strong and vibrant Mormon communities. You name the faith and they freely worship and add to our civil society. When you look at the rebirth of the Ukrainian language and customs, that is being led first and foremost by a Ukrainian civil society that has made demands and made it cool, made it fashionable to wear Ukrainian clothes, to speak Ukrainian on the streets, to uh, publish Ukrainian literature, to use Ukrainian in gaming, to use Ukrainian in fashion, from fashion to, 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 to everything in between. And lastly, although it's not in the title of our, of our, of our, of our uh, seminar today, our, our discussion, linguistic and financial, um, was the focus, civil society led the defense of Ukraine in 2014 when we were uh, attacked and occupied by Russian forces in Eastern Ukraine. Our military had been, let's say, run down, uh, not invested into. Some would argue purposefully, others might say otherwise. But the fact of the matter is that it was Ukrainian civil society that stood up and went to the front to defend the territorial integrity of the country even before we were able to rebuild, reinvest, and regain our footing as a military. Um, so if I come back to where we are after 30 years, with all of the ups and downs that the ambassador mentioned, with all of the failures that continue to haunt us on rule of law and in the independence of the judiciary, my singular belief is that a democracy is not a spectator sport. And what we can be assured of in Ukraine is that democracy is strong because Ukrainians are participants and that civil society is what will carry us forward going forward. Thank you, Michael. Mayor Sirieresko, thank you very much. Um, Congressman Huffo, um, the floor is yours. It's good to see you after so many years. Congressman, unmute. There we go. Uh, tripped up by technology once again. Uh, <laughs> it's a great pleasure to be here, moderator Sakyu, thank you. Uh, Dr. Perry, thank you for including me in this panel with such uh, distinguished co-panelists. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I wanted to start by giving a, a shout out, if I could, to the Ukrainian Educational and Cultural Center uh, that's located here on Cedar Road yeah. in Jenkintown. I'm sure uh, the audience is very familiar with the Cultural Center. I wanted to point out that um, 35 or 40 years ago, I can't even remember how long ago it was, uh, the first uh, executive director of the center, Arisha Hukla, uh, I, didn't, I don't think I said that right, Huka, um, lobbied me as a, as a um, state legislator uh, about Ukraine. She was a mentor. She uh, brought to my attention uh, the uh, great history and the great needs of Ukraine. And uh, listening to the panelists who have spoken, the two uh, uh, so well-qualified uh, government leaders, I, I think all the audience members ought to view themselves as lobbyists and do what Arisha did for me so many years ago. Talk to your elected officials, talk about Ukraine, uh, educate them, lobby them. Um, and I just want to thank Arisha for the the, the great job she did mentoring me. Um, it, it's uh, exciting to be here on the 30th anniversary. Uh, I recall very well um, when Ukraine declared independence, uh, particularly um, the December following the, the summertime declaration of independence, 
when 90% of the Ukrainian voters um, supported the act of independence and elected the first president. Uh, as an American, we can all take great uh, pride to see that level of democracy um, in a, a, a growing country. Um, I, th I think what we need to talk about and focus on now, um, particularly as Dr. Perry asked me to talk a little bit about the role that Congress has had and the government has had in, in the United States in supporting Ukraine, is to talk about how to uh, bring Ukraine even deeper into and more solidly with uh, the, um, uh, the Western uh, European American um, axis of, of support. Uh, because I think that uh, is clearly the future uh, for Ukraine. Uh, current events indicate that. And I think the, the freedom loving nature of the Ukrainian people indicate that the future is with Western society and Western governments. Um, I think our politicians have to uh, understand that our, our job is to help establish uh, that support for, for freedom and democracy in Ukraine. And Congress uh, has, uh, through the years, um, passed resolutions and proclamations and sometimes uh, legislation uh, to support Ukraine. Um, 20 years ago, uh, I was involved with some legislation to uh, uh, allow the Ukrainian government uh, to, um, on federal land in Washington, um, create a memorial to the, 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 the genocide famine of 1932-33, um, and, and also uh, supported legislation that passed that supported Ukraine for uh, acknowledging uh, that that famine really was uh, an intentional uh, act of terror by Russia uh, and a mass murder by Russia of Ukrainian citizens in 1932 and 33. Um, now, uh, since that time, um, Ukraine has become, I think, closer to the United States. The legislation that uh, Congress is dealing with uh, these days uh, uh, it goes beyond some of those um, proclamations we passed 20 years ago um, after the, uh, the murder of uh, Georgi Gadzi in uh, um, the year 2000. Uh, Congress passed legislation urging uh, free and open elections in, um, in Ukraine. And I think that's been achieved. Uh, uh, and the election of uh, President Zelensky, I think, is, uh, is uh, proof of that. Uh, but currently, uh, Congress is dealing with even more substantive legislation. Uh, there's uh, a bill introduced called the Ukraine Security Partnership Act uh, that would authorize the State Department for a period of five years uh, to give military grants and military training uh, to Ukraine uh, as, as part of that legislation. Uh, that's, that's important uh, substantive steps that really need to be taken. Uh, there's legislation to uh, forbid the federal government from ever recognizing Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea. Uh, it's got a great title, the Crimea Annexation Non-Recognition Act. Uh, and I hope that bill passes. Um, and there's, there's legislation to oppose the loosening of the sanctions regarding the uh, Nord Stream 2 pipeline, uh, which is a great concern because uh, Ukraine really is uh, in large measure at the mercy of Russia when it comes to uh, energy sources. And that is something the Western world has to help Ukraine overcome. Um, currently, uh, well, for the last 14 years, um, um, the uh, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe uh, has, has since 2014, I should say, uh, had uh, special uh, monitoring missions in Ukraine to uh, try to stop uh, the uh, Russian aggression in the eastern part of the country uh, and to bring uh, Kyiv and Moscow closer together to stop that violence. Uh, that mission has not been successful because of the continuing Russian interference uh, but just this past week, um, the, uh, the monitoring mission of the OSCE 
uh, had to be uh, uh, delayed because of the interference of uh, uh, Russian instigated mobs uh, outside of the hotels where the monitors were staying. Uh, the, the, the daily pressure continues um, on, on the uh, special uh, uh, mission trying to, to moderate uh, the, the bad actions by Russia in Eastern Ukraine. Um, they, they put out a daily uh, summary of activity and the, the summary put out yesterday for actions the day before indicated in the Donetsk re region, there were 216 ceasefire violations, including 16 explosions. Uh, that's, that's one day's uh, bad action uh, against uh, Ukrainian citizens um, uh, by these, uh, by these uh, Russian supported uh, actors. Uh, so the challenge is very real, uh, and um, the, the pressure is on the Western world to help Ukraine deal with this interference from Russia. Now, um, this week, uh, the uh, United States Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, uh, visited Ukraine uh, and said that Washington supports Kyiv's efforts to join NATO and that no other nation could veto uh, such an action. And in response today, the, um, the Russian news agency quoted the Russian deputy foreign minister, Andrei Rudenko, uh, saying that um, any move toward bringing Ukraine into NATO uh, would have dire consequences. Well, I think he's right. The dire consequences will be that when, not if, when Ukraine joins NATO, that will put an end to Russian military meddling uh, in, in the affairs of Ukraine. Section five of NATO, uh, which sits, says an attack on one is an attack on all, would give uh, to Ukraine that collective defense to which she's entitled uh, and which the, the United States must continue to support. Um, this week, the Ukrainian parliament uh, upgraded and enhanced the uh, existing National Anti-Corruption Bureau of Ukraine, which is an important effort uh, to, to not only weed out corruption in high places um, internally, but to send a terrific signal to the rest of the world that Ukraine is responsible for its actions, is, is cleaning up problems, and is worthy of all the support that we can possibly get. So these are very positive uh, uh, actions that have been taken. Uh, and finally, the, uh, the staff of the International Monetary Fund said this week that it's recommending to the full IMF a $5 billion loan uh, to Ukraine. Um, and they're recommending it because of the positive steps being taken in Ukraine uh, by the administration of President Zelensky uh, these anti-corruption efforts and, and other steps being taken uh, to, to bring Ukraine into uh, a, 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 a full uh, and close relationship and a democratic relationship uh, with Western Europe um, and with the United States. Um, so uh, there's been a reference uh, to President Biden to, tonight. There was uh, the uh, summit meeting between President Biden and Zelensky on uh, September 1st uh, in Washington. Uh, I think uh, that that was a very positive and successful meeting. Um, there will be a new um, uh, US-Ukraine strategic partnership charter negotiated this fall between the two countries as a result of that meeting um, that will contain uh, uh, a boost in the um, Strategic Par Partnership Commission uh, to establish a strategic defense framework, a strategic energy and climate dialogue, a lot of fancy commissions, but all evidence of, an, uh, of a relationship between our two countries growing closer and closer and closer, which I think is extremely, extremely helpful. So um, President Zelensky certainly has a, a challenge ahead of him uh, to continue the reforms, uh, to um, to hold bad actors accountable. But if he's able to do that, he will unlock uh, a, a whole uh, new set of resources from Western Europe and the United States that will help Ukraine take its rightful place 
as, as a leading democracy in the world. And so I, I would say if, if, if anybody wonders uh, whether people uh, still fight for their liberty, let them look to Ukraine. Uh, if, if anyone uh, asks if democratic values uh, can stand up against raw aggression, let them look to Ukraine. And if we need uh, a, an ally, a, a, a strong and dependable ally in the fight for freedom around the world, let us look to Ukraine. Thank you. Well, Congressman, thank you very much. Um, in all honesty, Congressman, you stole a lot of my thunder um, in terms <laughs> of some of the questions that I was going to, to pose today and some of the topics as well. But uh, obviously, um, uh, we'll get into a dialogue right now um, and, 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 and discuss a little further. Uh, Ambassador Markarova, uh, Minister Yuresko, uh, Congressman, um, thank you uh, very much for your opening remarks. I think I I've taken a lot of notes uh, during your presentation, during your opening remarks, and, and I think one of the common themes here is civil society slash advocacy. Um, it's quite obvious that what Ukraine has seen in the past 30 years, or even prior to Ukraine's renewal, uh, renewed independence in August of 1991, um, most of it, if not all of it, is attributed to um, civil society and a very active um, um, populace in terms of recognizing and understanding its natural, uh, national identity. I had mentioned in my opening remarks that I have done two events, moderating two events today. One event was, was um, uh, an event about, about Russian aggression, staying ahead of, 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 Kremlin's Russian, uh, of Kremlin's aggression in the Central and East European region. And the other one was based on a, a, a dialogue um, based on a, a conference on national identity and, and Ukraine's historic perspective, of which I was um, afforded the opportunity to moderate a panel about the, um, the dynamic in Ukraine in the last few years of the Soviet Union from uh, 1986 with the explosion of the Chernobyl nuclear plant, obviously to, to the, the, the movement of Ruch, the popular movement in Ukraine, um, as well as the, uh, the revolution of the granite, as they say, the granite revolution, which students participated in 1990. All of that, all of that had to do with an opportunity for Ukraine citizens to become part of a democratic system and voicing and expressing themselves. Congressman, um, I'm gonna begin a question with you. Um, you had mentioned, and I'm glad that you had mentioned um, that you were one of the co-sponsors and thankful uh, to, for your support, one of the co-sponsors of the bill to establish the memorial in Washington DC on federal land to the victims of the Ukraine and genocide, the whole of the mud. Um, there are so many other initiatives, many of which that you have mentioned, and in particular, one of the, the newest initiatives, which is Ukraine related, but also um, uh, for the entire world in terms of this new term that's being called kleptocracy. It's not so much an oligarch per se, but it's a kleptocracy, it's a klepto kleptocratic government, um, and the issues surrounding kleptocracy within types of authoritarian, authoritarian regimes. There are now initiatives within Congress, both in the House of Representatives and in the Senate to advance um, kleptocracy laws um, in terms of the, any type of kleptocrat, any type of oligarch um, investing in the United States within our banking system, as well as anything else that is nefarious um, throughout the world. How do you think um, that that is going to, um, uh, to assist and have an impact um, on Ukrainian society as they uh, try to expose various realms of, of corruption within, uh, within Ukrainian society. Um, is this an opportunity for Ukraine to advance itself along with other countries of the world that are dealing with this same type of
its independence in the last 30 years. Um, Minister Yaresko, I have kind of a two-part question um, for you. Um, one is coming from me is one, and, and one is coming from, from uh, one of our audience um, participants as well. Um, you had mentioned in terms of um, Ukraine society and the advancement and the all-inclusiveness of Ukraine society, especially as it entails the All-Ukrainian Council of Churches and Religious Organizations. I think it is a uh, it, it is a wonderful organization. It's a it's a wonderful opportunity to bring all of Ukraine's religious organizations and 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 uh, beliefs um, around one particular table and how each belief um, uh, resonates and 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 understands that if Ukraine is not secure, um, that our religious freedoms obviously would be under duress. You mentioned the Thomas. I had mentioned the Thomas. I, 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 I do admit I got the year wrong. It's 2018, not 2019. So thank you for correcting me on that. Um, that sent a signal to Ukraine society. That sent a signal to, to, to Ukraine as a nation that you can have your own independent church um, and you can deal um, uh, within your, your realm, within your territory. If I can ask, maybe this will be a question for you, Minister Yuresko, as maybe uh, I'll even ask the ambassador. What do you think of the role, since this is a Catholic institution, Manor College, obviously a Catholic institution, Sisters of St. Basil, what do you think can be the role or has been the role and can still be the role of the Vatican in terms of promoting greater civic um, um, identity and promoting Ukraine, Ukrainian identity um, in, in Ukraine? As a member of the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, I don't think I'm qualified to speak on behalf of the Vatican. So, although my mother, my mother, my mother did go to church, uh, go to school in Fox Chase with the Bazillion Sisters, so I do have a relationship directly to, to the region and, and to the sisters. But that said, what I would argue, um, and I'll turn it over to to the ambassador instead, is that the role of all of the churches, uh, the role of Ukrainian Catholic University, the role of uh, having our own uh, Ukrainian Orthodox Church to be able to pray in our own language officially in a recognized fashion. The role of this interfaith tolerance and respect and cooperation to me is more important with all due respect than anything the Vatican can do because it's ours. It's ours from, and it's, it's homegrown. It's, it's directly from the roots of the people. When you think back to the Maidan, to our revolution of dignity, and you think, and you stood on that square in the freezing cold, and every Sunday would start with an interfaith prayer, and you had the mufti and the rabbis and the ministers and the pastors and the priests, everyone praying together for the safety, for the freedom, and for the people of Ukraine, regardless of faith. To me, it's that example, it's that living tolerance and that living respect that is probably the most critical thing. I was on a trip to the Netherlands for business when I was the Minister of Finance and that Interfaith Council was visiting at the same time. And we just happened to be, I think at either the Council General or the Ambassador's residence there for, for, for a meeting and they came in and the Dutch government officials were so incredibly impressed mm -hmm. with the fact that that type of Interfaith Council could be standing for Ukraine in capitals all over the world, showing that type of unity again, tolerance, understanding and respect. To me, that's more than any outside party with all due respect to the Vatican or you know, to, to, to uh, Istanbul and the, the center of the Orthodox Church, the patriarch, um, anyone. And so I'll, I'll leave the Vatican for the ambassador and, and just say that my faith is kind of in the, the groundswell of, of people. No, it's a great it's a great response, uh, Minister. I thank you for that. Uh, maybe I should have um, expanded on it because obviously during Soviet times, um, the Ukrainian Catholic Church was one of the largest underground subjugated churches, um, and the Ukra and, and the Vatican obviously did help um, in terms of bringing that to the forefront um, in all types of international fora. So maybe to that extent of what more now can the Vatican do, if at all anything. Uh, much like Istanbul did for, for the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. Madam Ambassador, please. Thank you. Well, I think, you know, uh, if you are talking, about, it's, it's the question we always hear about all other spheres, right? What, what, what can more 
diaspora do? What can more our strategic partners do? What can, uh, I, I think in, in the first and foremost, a lot of things we have to do in Ukraine. And uh, when we are fighting for our freedom, then there are a lot of people who can support us. When we are building our economy, then there are a lot of people who can participate and join us. So um, what we already have surprised the world several times with our revolutions, with our fight, with our reforms, with building some of the institutions from scratch and being effective with them, I think this is the best kind of uh, push from Ukraine in order to get the support. Now, of course, you know, if you look back on, especially on the um, religious organizations, during the Soviet time, so many of them were oppressed. And yes, there was a vibrant underground church, but still, you know, it was impossible even when I was growing up uh, and it was the end of the Soviet Union when I was going to school, but still we, we were not able to worship openly. We were not able to go to the church openly. So at the same time, Ukrainians are very, again, because we didn't have our statehood for so many centuries, Ukrainians trust their communities. That's why the reform of decentralization was so effective. And if you look at the polls uh, in Ukraine, the highest trust that Ukrainians show to the institutions are now to two institutions, church and army. Right. And right. army is the new one. It's only after 2015. Exactly. So church is still very high on the agenda. And I'm very proud that both Ukrainian Catholic Church and Ukrainian, Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church and Ukrainian uh, Orthodox Church, all of the Ukrainian churches that, the, for example, right now, they're very proactive on vaccination. That they, because people listen to them. They're very proactive on the fact that we Ukrainians have to work hard. We have to support the army. We have to... Uh, support the Ukrainian. It's it's very important that the church is is at the forefront because Ukrainians believe uh, have a high belief to, to church leaders. Now, what more can be done? We have a vision as the government, as Ukrainians, of what Ukraine we are building. We build Ukraine that is strong, uh, that is whole, with returned Crimea and returned. Donetsk and Lugansk Oblast with our people free. We built Ukraine that is economically strong and where Ukrainians participate in the, in the wealth of the country. We built Ukraine, which is part of NATO and part of European Union. So I think all of these agendas, the more our partners and the more church as the very trusted institution can do to help us to support all of those, uh, you know, uh, parts of our vision and of our dream, uh, the better it's going to be. So I'm very, I'm very glad the church is very active, especially here in the United States. All of the churches, uh, all of the Ukrainian churches, they are actually doing more than just being churches. I mean, they are the leaders of the communities, whether in Philadelphia, Washington, Chicago, you know, our churches are true leaders of the community and, and the priests and people who work there and volunteers and uh, uh, diaspora members. And they do talk to the uh, to, to Congress people here and they do talk to the opinion leaders here and they do write uh, to all the decision makers here. So I think, you know, all of these issues and all of the agenda that we have here, build our bilateral relations, hold Russia in, uh, into account for everything they have done, make them stop, make them you know, uh, not only stop, uh, you know, pretending that there is a, a ceasefire. And as Congressman rightly said, you know, they were losing soldiers and we're losing people uh, on the front on a regular basis. But also start effective steps into resolving the situation, into giving the Crimea back, into giving the Donetsk and Lugansk Oblast back. So I think the role of, of uh, uh, religious institutions is very big there. And again, um, I have learned, uh, I knew back home that it's a very unique experience that we have of this council of churches where uh, all Christians and Muslims and uh, uh, Jewish uh, uh, churches come together and actually discuss issues on a regular basis of a great importance, mm -hmm. regardless of the faith, but great importance for people, for Ukrainians. Uh, I realized here how unique it is.
you know, it's it's really, I think, where one of the few, if not the only country on the globe where we do not only coexist peacefully, but we actually make take decisions peacefully together. I think, I think you really need to point out, because I'm not sure that everyone's as aware, but Roman Catholics don't have the right to... Uh, to, to be uh, organized churches in Russia next door. The Mormons have no right to exist in the country next door. People consistently raise questions of Ukrainian tolerance, consistently disinformation about intolerance and lack of respect. And Ukraine is the single place where not only the respect exists, but that they flourish they flourish, every single one of them, and work together. And I really think that that is something that every congressman in the United States should know, every leader in every foreign country should know, because many countries don't in enjoy the level of peace and cooperation that we do in Ukraine, and it is the singular place in the former Soviet Union. Wonderful, uh, wonderful responses. I, I, I thank the minister, I thank the ambassador. Um, I think that was spot on in terms of, of understanding the current dynamic in Ukraine, obviously, um, and, and looking at one of Ukraine's neighbors and, and the dynamic that exists there as well. Um, a question from the audience um, to Minister Yaresko as well as to um, Congressman Huffle. Um, can you share, in your view, what are the crucial steps in Ukraine's struggle with endemic corruption and lack of transparency in Ukraine? And the two-parter um, uh, potentially for the congressman is how can the Ukrainian American diaspora help in these efforts? So first to you, Minister Yaresko, and, uh, um, and to follow up with uh, Congressman Huffle. So first of all, I wanna remind everyone that there's corruption everywhere. Uh, the question is the degree to which it disturbs the functioning of governance and the degree to which it destroys uh, confidence in our public institutions. And in Ukraine, indeed, Corruption is too large, too great, and has destroyed confidence and is not uh, enabling us to get the value from our tax system, from our customs system, from our governance that we, that we deserve and that the people of Ukraine deserve. In the end, it is cultural, and it's cultural because there's no rule of law. And until the judicial reform is completed, and until everyone understands equally those who are participating as givers and those who are takers, because remember there are two sides, as long as the givers and the takers are not yet of a full understanding that there are consequences. I'm originally born and raised in Chicago. Corruption is not unknown in Chicago, <laughs> but there is a general understanding amongst the majority of people that there are consequences for actions and that we will all be treated similarly in the eyes of a judge and a court. That doesn't mean that some people don't think that they'll outsmart the system. In every society, there are people who believe somehow they will outsmart the system. It doesn't mean you eliminate corruption, but you dampen it when, for example, as a business person, you fear giving a bribe because you will pay consequences. As much as the person either taking and or asking for one fears asking because they will actually have consequences. Today in Ukraine, those consequences are at best uneven your vision of whether or not you get a fair and impartial hearing in, in a courtroom are at best uneven. That doesn't mean you can't get an impartial and fair hearing. The issue is as a, as a participant in this culture of corruption, you don't know. And so you're not incentivized fully to actually uh, do the right thing. And so this is a combination and it will take time once judicial reform is completed, and once people start having faith in an independent judicial system that gives them fair treatment, equal treatment, such that not the, the son of someone special gets off of running a person down with his Jeep, and you, a general, you know, everyday Joe, have to go to jail for running someone down with your Jeep. That can't be how the perception is. And once the perceptions start changing, then you can start changing culture. But I think the two have to work hand in hand and we're not even close yet to changing the judicial system and making it free, fair and impartial, which is the first step to engaging people in having confidence. Confidence that also involves fear of consequence to not participate in that system. 
Congressman Hoffo, how, how do you see our advocacy as a Ukrainian American community? How can we assist um, in that endemic corruption or that lack of transparency in Ukraine? What more can we do? Lobby, lobby, lobby. Uh, and uh, the more personal the contact you can have with elected officials, the better. It's not always easy to get in to see uh, members of Congress or senators, um, but try. Uh, and don't give up. Uh, and the more personal the contact, so a personal visit's the best. A phone call is okay. A uh, phone call is better than a, a, a piece of mail. If you have to write a letter, handwrite it, because that's more personal than a typed um, letter. Uh, email isn't worth an awful lot because it's abused and used by so many people. <clears throat> You've got to tell the story. Uh, and, and the minister just laid out exactly what, what the truth is, uh, the challenge that Ukraine has. So as a lobbyist for Ukraine, as everybody on this call can be, tell the truth. So when the politician says, oh, do you have a problem with corruption in Ukraine or whatever? Say yes and, and be honest about what it is, but then talk about the steps being taken uh, to fix the, the matter. So uh, transparency, honesty as a lobbyist, but relentlessness, uh, stay on message, keep asking for help, keep educating like Arisha did for me 40 years ago. Let me also add, if I may, to Please. this, uh, uh, I think, excellent. so if we were talking about Ukraine, uh, in 2013, 14, then yes, endemic corruption and total lack of transparency. Now, I just wanted to add a little bit what we have done during the past years to change it. And yes, as Natalie said, I mean, this changes, especially the judicial reform, which we are only starting with the laws adopted this summer. Uh, and it wasn't easy to adopt these laws. I mean, the, the, the uh, you know, it's, uh, um, the system fight back is, is very, very strong. But, you know, it's also a behavioral change. I mean, you know how much time judicial reforms take in, in other countries where they have been successful. It's not only the laws, it's not even implementation of the laws. It's also getting the society to buy into this reform because it requires everyone to participate in a different way. But since 2015, Ukraine has been a leader in transparency. I mean, you mentioned the, uh, e-data that we have opened uh, all the public transactions in the in the Ministry of Finance. We are one of a few countries where you actually can go online and see every hryvnia that the state spends on pretty much everything. We have also opened all the registries. So in Ukraine, unlike in, in many countries, including the U.S., you can get into the, all the registries and you can see the real estate and the companies and the ultimate beneficial owners. It's all public now. We also have the asset declarations for the public officials. Now, uh, they, they, they are definitely more detailed and widespread and totally pu public compared to the majority of the countries, including the United States. So, I mean, whether do, do we have a corruption in the country? Of course, I mean, that's why we are fighting against it, but it's probably one of the most transparent corruptions um, uh, if, if you compare us to other countries, because you can actually see everything, our journalists can see and investigate everything, and our society, civil society, can actually demand, you know, the changes, because they see the information, and the situation is very different if you compare it to what it was eight years ago. Uh, so with the transparency, it's a first step, but the most important one is accountability. We are, the, the transparency is already there. You can see, you can research, you can write about it, and you can. Uh, you don't even need to write requests. It's it's all out there. The question is how to leapfrog and get to the next stage, while knowing all of this, seeing all of this. How to make people accountable, and how to make people who violate the system bring them um, to justice. And also, you know. There is a debate and discussion now about the compliance and financial monitoring when you spoke about the kleptocracy. Now, the financial monitoring laws, the last one adopted in Ukraine in 2019, is actually, we already have in place what you are discussing now here in the United States. Because in Ukraine, it's not, it's not only banks, it's also the real estate brokers, the notary publics, the lawyers, 
all of them are the agent, the primary agent of the financial monitoring and compliance. So all of them in Ukraine already since 2020, when the law started being implemented, are responsible for checking the, you know, the, the buyers of the real estate. So it's, it's not only inside the banking system anymore. So again, I mean, yes, it's a, it's a long road to go. And it's a very hard changes. I mean, it's uh, all the low hanging fruits that we have done in 2015, 2016. We don't have uh, something like that to be done. All the reforms that we have to do now, the land reform, the judicial reform, it's a heavy lifting operation. Uh, and it will, it will require years as well. You know, even if everything is done in the most straightforward and, and uh, you know, coherent way, it will take years, if not decades, to have the full results, but we just have to stay the course. So along those lines, there's another question from one of the audience participants, um, um, members, and they had said that obviously we as Ukrainian Americans have uh, established in our, ourselves um, fairly well um, in the United States um, and would like to help Ukraine and help um, entrepreneurs in Ukraine. What would be the best methodologies? What would you recommend? How would they um, go about uh, directly investing in Ukraine with businesses? For, for Ambassador uh, uh, Markarova, as well as for, for Minister Yeresko. So there are a lot of ways how the Ukrainian American community can help. And I will not only talk about the investment in Ukraine first, uh, we still have a very large, two large state-owned uh, enterprises sector, and we still have way too many state-owned banks. Now, while we are preparing the majority of them, or, or a lot of them for privatizations, they all require a, a good corporate governance. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the high-level professionals who also happen to be Ukrainians and speak Ukrainian, uh, are the best suited candidates for the supervisory boards to actually apply and participate and help us to run this uh, uh, to run these companies efficiently and do the difficult changes inside them. So I would uh, I know it's it's a difficult job. It's not an easy job to do the turnaround. Those uh, of uh, people with the business experience who participated in it know how difficult it is. And here it's uh, it's even more difficult because those are the uh, state-owned companies with all the additional issues that come with being a state company in addition, just big and sometimes inefficient. But that really, a, 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 you know, the, the corporate governance reform that we have implemented now calls for these boards to be created in the majority of companies. And it's a question whether the reform is going to be successful, whether we will have a really uh, seasoned uh, professionals who also care for Ukraine on those boards. Now, the second part is how to invest in Ukraine. Um, uh, we de deregulated uh, the, uh, a lot. So whether you would like to invest in the government securities as the first step, just to see, or you want to go really and work with uh, companies back home. Um, uh, first of all, of course, contact Ukraine Invest, not because I have created it, but because that institution continues to work uh, after the change of the government, after the change of the directors of the institution, it's a one-stop shop for anyone to get the information and, and get uh, uh, talk to people, talk to the professional uh, financial service providers, I mean, the banks and the uh, investment companies, they would be happy to give you an advice and uh, uh, help and cho choose your partners. But again, I think, you know, Ukraine with all the issues that we mentioned today here provides quite a number of interest in investment opportunities and of course use the embassy as the resource i mean economic diplomacy is one of the key priorities that president zelensky now put in front of uh, uh, for all of the ambassadors this is um, a new such a big focus for economic diplomacy so uh, my team here in washington dc our Consulates in, in Chicago, New York, San Francisco, and hopefully soon in Houston, and also our honorary councils. And you have excellent honorary council in Philadelphia, uh, Irina Mazur, who would be more than happy to provide you with all the information. Please use us as a resource if you have any interest in Ukraine, or if you don't have any interest in Ukraine, then we are encouraging you to start having an interest, and we would be happy to provide with the information. 
I'll be a little more conservative than the ambassador, though I don't disagree with anything she said. I think if you are a Ukrainian diaspora member, uh, you need to seriously look at Ukraine as an emerging market investment place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you are not prepared to invest in securities in the United States, then you're not prepared to invest in them in Ukraine. If you're not prepared to invest in individual stocks in the publicly listed market in Ukraine, which many Ukrainian diaspora do not do, then you're not prepared to make direct investments in Ukrainian businesses. You have to be a level even more sophisticated than you are in your investment strategy in the United States. So to my parents' generation that kept their monies in kreditivkas, in credit unions, in deposit accounts, never had a mutual fund, never had any risk capital, Ukraine is not the place where you begin. So if you are an investor who runs businesses and you want to invest in like businesses because that's what you know, that's what you do well, and you're looking for that opportunity elsewhere, then it makes perfect sense. But you're, you, you should not have heard unfortunate stories from diaspora members who came and you know, invested their whole life savings into sometimes a relative's business and sometimes just a friend, and then are surprised um, that it didn't necessarily go that well. That wouldn't be any different than elsewhere. You don't invest in what you don't know and don't understand. And so I urge you to understand that the risk level is higher than for the same group of securities or investment you would make in the United States, again, because of a rule of law. And so if you, if you are a diaspora member who is you know, keeping your money in the credit union, it's not time to take your life savings and invest in what you don't understand. But, but there is a great way to invest in the economy of Ukraine, and that is to invest in the people of Ukraine. Absolutely. There are places like Kiev Mohila, Ostrovska Akademia, Ukrainian Catholic University, each of which are more than happy, willing, able, and capable to create scholarship funds for students to study, to be able to develop that economy. There are, uh, you know, uh, groups that support uh, small business education. There is the U United Women's Group, United Women's League, I think it's called in Ukraine, that works with women throughout the country. And so your ability to invest in the economy of Ukraine is extraordinarily great. It's a question of, I think, choosing the tool that fits your risk profile. Remember in the United States, as an example, you cannot invest in a private equity fund if you don't qualify as a sophisticated investor, meaning you don't have over a million dollars in assets, you're not allowed. That's part of the regulatory system in the United States for a reason to not have people kind of just losing their life savings left and right. And so I think there are many ways to invest in the economy, even if you're not a strategic investor with experience that you can do safely and with great uh, confidence that those funds will be used well to help build that economy. I think both both of those answers are are not just adequate; they're 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 spot on um, in terms of exactly what is necessary. You have to understand the markets. We we all understand um, um, investing and how investments happen in other parts of the world. Um, obviously, the same thing with Ukraine. So I know Dr. Perry had a comment um, regarding uh, regarding students and and interaction with uh, with Ukrainian students. Thank you, thank you, Michael. Just wanted to share that uh, Manor um, would certainly welcome the investment into Ukrainian students who would wish to attend Manor for a term of years and then return to Ukraine with the education gained at Manor College as well. So if anyone wanted to invest in those scholarships um, for Ukrainian students at Manor, we would welcome that. Excellent, excellent. Um, Congressman, I, I, I think this may be one of the last questions as we're kind of nearing uh, the bewitching hour of, uh, of eight o'clock. You had mentioned the litany of uh, congressional initiatives which are out there right now. Um, the Crimean Annexation Non-Recognition Act. You mentioned about the um, Ukrainian Security Partnership Act, uh, which right now is, is going forth in the United States Senate. There is opposition, which uh, I'm hearing from both sides of the aisle when it comes to Nord Stream 2 and making sure that it doesn't become operational. Um, this, 
the, 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 the enlargement of NATO and keeping that process open or that open door policy, as, as they call it in, in, in Brussels, reminds me basically of the reason why we're doing this. And the reason why we're doing this is that there is a strategic partnership which exists between Ukraine and the United States. It was formed back in 2008. It's had many iterations along the way. Um, and President Zelensky, when he was here with, with President Biden um, at the beginning of September, um, uh, reinstated that particular strategic partnership. And I do know that, that next month there is a commission and working groups that will be established on various realms and various um, entities and various um, uh, spheres uh, in, in Ukrainian uh, society on, on, on how to advance the strategic partnership. You know, this reminds me of, of, of Zbigniew Brzezinski um, as, as Jimmy Carter's national security advisor, a Polish American, um, knew Ukraine very, very well. Uh, I think he gave, gave great advice to President Carter at that particular time regarding the Soviet Union. But since he left office or since he left um, government, um, his government positions, he had written many books. And one of his books was The Grand Chessboard. And in that grand chessboard, um, um, Mr. Brzezinski alluded to the so sole fact that Ukraine is the keystone to security and stability in Europe. Also going on and, and, and further um, uh, mentioning that without Ukraine, Russia is not an entity. Russia, Russia is not an empire. Rus Russia will, will, will not necessarily exist because it obviously needs um, a lot of Ukrainian resources and the meddling that it does and so forth and so on. We've spoken about civil society. We've spoken about advocacy. Um, us as a Ukrainian American community, what we have done, whether in an organized fashion since 1940, my organization, um, other organizations along the way, what do you say to those congressional naysayers that this is not the time to be helping Ukraine, that, that um, uh, we have other priorities, domestic and or international, how do you give them that twist um, that Ukraine is important? It is a strategic partner of the United States, which if I may note, um, the United States does not have strategic partnerships with every country of the world. There are very few, I think you can count on, on, on uh, two hands or, or maybe a little bit more of the strategic partnerships that exist between the United States and said countries. How do you get those members of Congress to, to finally get them over the hump to make sure that they are fully in support of all, our, all of our efforts, all of these initiatives to, to assist Ukraine? I think the, the best way to do that, the kind of the, the, the shortcut to get uh, emotionally to, to the, um, the politicians is to simply point out um, what Ukraine faces at the hands of Russia. Now, Russia is an unpopular nation in the United States for good reason. Uh, I'm sure the Russian people are wonderful. I have met some uh, and they're wonderful people, but the government is totally unacceptable uh, and their actions in annex uh, annexing um, Crimea, completely illegal. Um, you know, you know uh, since 2014, all, all of the Russian sponsored unrest in uh, Eastern Ukraine have, has claimed about 14,000 lives. That, that's a huge number. That's a couple of thousand people dying every year over this pretty long period of time. So I, I think um, from, from, a, from a public relations standpoint, Ukraine is fortunate to have such an unpopular uh, opponent. And I think uh, lobbyists for Ukraine should focus on the, the bad actors and bad actions of the Russian government. Uh, talk about the 14,000 lives lost. I think most Americans do not know uh, that the, uh, the death toll has been so steady and so large uh, since 2014 in Ukraine. Uh, and, um, and make the point that Ukraine is a democracy emerging on the world stage as a freedom loving country, uh, um, cleaning up its act, if you will, uh, and, and uh, getting closer and closer, uh, going to reach out to join the European Union, going to apply for NATO membership. Um, it, I, I think it's a very positive message that this is the time to help a country that is essential for us to promote democracy uh, and freedom in uh, Eastern and Central Europe. 
One of the things that I would even add to that, Congressman, if I can, um, is that it is in the national security interest of the United States to keep Ukraine free, independent, sovereign, um, and it being an example for other countries in the region. Um, obviously, uh, we know the situation which is happening in Belarus for the past 15 plus months, um, as they had a falsified election, much like Ukraine had, obviously, in 2004 um, for the Orange Revolution, of which, uh, uh, Congressman, if you remember, you were in Congress at that particular time, um, and the spur of activity um, that came in Congress on a bipartisan basis um, in trying to assist Ukraine. So I think all of these things are absolutely positively um, necessary. Um, Madam uh, uh, Minister, Minister Yadesko, you have something to say, yes. I, I do, if I can just add. Please. I, it's really important, um, and, and sometimes we don't like to hear this, but you know, it, it just seems to me, Congressman, with all due respect, that um, Congress acts and is highly supportive and engaged, and as Michael, you said, after the, or during the Revolution of Dignity, or during and after the Orange Revolution, because they see that the Ukrainian people themselves Correct. are going for those very pure rights that we all believe in. They're building their democracy. And at times it feels like, with all due respect again to, our, to, to the US Congress, that they seem to think that, oh, well, because they're not on the streets in a revolution, that they're not fighting as hard for those same values. And I guess the one thing I'd like for the diaspora to understand and make every congressman understand is that every day in Ukraine, we are fighting for that democracy. We are fighting for that freedom, for that territorial integrity. Every morning, every 24 hours of every day, seven days a week, 12 months a year, while we single-handedly and alone, alone, Yes, we have support in training and we have support in military. I'm not suggesting there's not support, but standing, standing on the front lines alone. And when we look at what happened in Afghanistan as an example, and we say, well, you know, the Afghanis just couldn't do it on their own and we couldn't be there forever. I want you to juxtapose that as a diaspora to the Ukrainians doing it absolutely alone every single day for now seven years and without any end, without any promise of an end, with no one standing next to them. And I think that that message has to be driven home to Congress and to everyone else that just because it's not a revolution, it doesn't mean that we're not as strong in standing up for those things that you admired about us as a nation when we were in the midst of the revolution. Minister Yeresko, um, this actually reminds me of a wonderful example which happened in Congress to tie in the congressional angle here, um, exactly to your point. Um, uh, several months or a year in post-revolution um, of dignity, sometime in, in 2014 or 2015, there was a group of Ukrainian parliamentarians that came to, to, to Congress and obviously wanted to meet with, with um, their counterparts in the United States Congress, their counterparts in terms of the Congressional Ukrainian Caucus, the Senate Ukraine Caucus, and so forth. And basically at that particular time, these members of Congress, senators or, or representatives were, were, were looking to the Ukrainians and saying, well, what, 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 what can we do for you? And the answer from the parliamentarians, the Ukrainian parliamentarians was quite stark. They gave an example of what just had happened in Ukraine several months prior. EU parliamentarians had come to Ukraine and they began their negotiations, they began their, 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 their discussions, their dialogue with Ukrainian parliamentarians and so forth. And the EU parliamentarians had begged, pleaded um, to, to, uh, for the Ukrainian parliamentarians to take them to the front lines. They wanted to see what was actually happening on the front lines in, in, in Ukraine. So they did. The Ukrainian parliamentarians, the EU parliamentarians had an opportunity to interact with those Ukrainian soldiers that were defending Ukraine and ask this question of the Ukrainian soldiers, what are you doing? What are you defending? Why are you here? Three responses came from the Ukrainian soldiers. The first response is, I'm defending my family. The second is, I am defending my country. And the third, most unique and stark to me, we are defending Europe. There you go. That's exactly to the point of Minister Yeresko, which you had just mentioned, and to the point what I had mentioned in terms of this is a strategic partnership. This is in the national interest of the United States to ensure that Ukraine is a democratic sovereign entity 
um, and country uh, within uh, Central and East Europe, within a Europe that is, that is whole and free. So with that, I think, um, um, Dr. Perry, uh, I think we're, we are close to the bewitching hour at eight o'clock. Um, I know that uh, we've had a very spirited discussion. Um, I, I'm so extremely grateful for this opportunity. I'd like to thank our panelists for this enlightening um, discussion. Enlightened discussion, you've given us much food for thought and, and a lot of homework to do, as a matter of fact. Um, Ukraine is a country we all care about. And as a community, we have worked and will work to ensure its territorial integrity, but also its integrity as a nation steeped in European traditions and structures. So thank you to the audience members for your participation, your questions. We couldn't get to all of them. There were a multitude of questions. Um, but in, in any event, I think it was a very thought provoking discussion and a big thank you um, to the Manor College team who made this possible behind the scenes of which I can be in front of the screen. I'm not a technical person to be the, behind the screen. <laughs> so with that, have a wonderful evening. Um, um, and Dr. Perry, uh, thank you again for this opportunity to moderate. Um, we await your closing remarks. Thank you so much, Michael. And thank you again to all of our speakers. It was a wonderful, wonderful dialogue and conversation, really fantastic. And thank you, Michael. I uh, also wanna thank uh, Kelly Pfeiffer, who was behind the scenes from our marketing and advancement office, as well as everyone in the office for their support for, for today's program. Thank you again to our leading sponsor, the Ukrainian Self-Reliance Federal Credit Union. If you're interested in supporting Manor College, with a scholarship or in other ways, please visit manor.edu forward slash donate. And uh, I'll leave you with a teaser for the spring. <laughs> please keep an eye out for our 12th Ukraine dialogue program. It will be a bit of an extension of our 30 years of Ukrainian independence theme. For the moment, it is titled, The Constitutions of the United States and Ukraine parallels and possibilities. And one of our own Ukrainian community committee of Manor's board of trustee members, of which, for example, Michael is a part. Um, this one is uh, Judge Bodan Fute. He will be a panelist and will invite all of you to join us. So please keep our programs and our speakers, our students, Ukraine, the United States, Europe, our communities, and Manor College in your prayers. Thank you and God bless you all. Madam Ambassador, Madam Minister, Congressman, thank you very much. It was a, a very spirited discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Perry. Dobranich, good night. Good night. Bye-bye.